Good morning, and welcome to our service. We have the privilege to worship yet one more time. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come before you this morning, grateful hearts for your goodness, your mercy, and your love that you shed for us. Father, we just want to thank you again for your love. We can't say that often enough. We just thank you that you hear us. We thank you that you have promised to be with us. And Lord, we invite your presence with us today. May our worship be honoring to you. Pray that you will be with each one that takes part. Give each one the wisdom and clear thinking they need. May our worship be beneficial to all of us and honoring to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll have three songs and then Brother Dell will have devotions. In your Christian hymn, there is number 837. Eight hundred and thirty seven. Lord, I am born.
six. Number four hundred and six. Faith of our fathers Welcome each one to our service this morning. For devotional this morning, I'm going to be reading out of Luke 18 to start out of, and then also out of Luke 19. Luke 18 here is the account of, um, I better make sure I got the right one actually before I say, um, the rich young man. And then Luke 19, um, we're going to talk about Zacchaeus. And I don't know if you've ever heard these two talked about at the same time, but maybe you'll think about them in just a little bit different way after this morning. Luke 18, 18 through 23. And a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good, save one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments, Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother. And he said, All these have I kept from my youth up. Now when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, Yet lackest thou one thing, sell all that thou hast, and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. And when he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? I read one verse farther there than I was planning. Okay, so take note what happened here. He thought that he was a good guy. He followed the commandments through his youth. And then let's go over to chapter 19 and read about Zacchaeus. Verse 1 through 10. 
And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was very and he was rich, and he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press, because he was little of stature, and he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was past that way. Now when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him, and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste, and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste, and came down, and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying, that he was gone to be a guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as also he is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that, that which was lost. A little bit of a contrast here. First guy comes and thinks that he's going to be complimented for everything that he was, had done right in his life. But when Jesus told him to go do something to make so he could have his life right with him and he could have a relationship with him, all of a sudden the walls went up. Like, wait, I thought I'm doing everything here. Um, that's one thing I don't think I'm going to give up right now. Um, but then you come over to Zacchaeus. Jesus never even told him that we have in this passage, anyhow, that what he needs to do. He knew what he lacked in his life, and all it took was the master to kind of bring that out. Um, and it was just very interesting, his reaction here. Um, he never said that, oh, yeah, I'll give back what I owe to the people. Fourfold is what he gave. And I don't know if you all noticed it or not, but it also said, there in verse 2 that he was rich. Both of these men had a lot of money. Money was not an issue with any of them, um, other than the love of money. I guess that was an issue. But the first man wasn't willing to give that up for Jesus. Zacchaeus was, and it never even took asking. The rich young ruler went away sorrowful because he wasn't willing to give up what God asked him to how many times do we do that? We're so concerned about doing what we think is the right thing to do that we forget to actually um, worry about what God wants us to do, and we focus on one thing that we miss the next thing that really is what God um, desires us to be um, working in. Maybe it's the opposite of this. Maybe you're giving all the money that you could possibly give, but you're ignoring the um, broken-hearted brother beside you. Um, it doesn't matter what it is. Jesus desires our all, not just all in one thing, but all in all that we do. So just because you are not like these men and stealing from the poor or um, maybe you give your tithes, don't think that you are okay and you're not greedy. Um, you could be greedy of your time. Um, you're not willing to help someone out. Um, my challenge for you is that we would all seek God and ask him, am I doing everything in my life um, that you want me to be doing and not get caught up with doing what I want to be doing or what I think God wants me to do, um, just that we would seek God and allow him to speak into our lives. Let's kneel for prayer. Lord, we just come to you this morning and thank you for this time that we can have in your house and worshiping you. And just thank you for the freedom that we have that we can do that. And just pray that you would be with the service today, be with each one that was part. And just pray that your name would be honored and glorified. And just pray that you would just speak to our hearts and draw us close to you. Just so you know. Thank you for that thought-provoking devotions, Delvin. Trust me, friends, if there's one thing in your heart that you're holding back from God, that is the very thing God will lay his fingers on and ask you to give up. That's just the way it works. He wants everything. Um, with that...
Time is here to dismiss for Sunday school. Um, sickness is continuing to cause issues. The intermediates will be joining the youth again. And there will only be one ladies class in the back of the auditorium here. So with that, the youth and intermediates can be dismissed. Juniors. Primary. And preschool. And the adults can take their place. lesson illustrates the truth Paul proclaimed in Ephesians 2 verse 10 for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them genuine faith in Jesus Christ will result in works that demonstrate that faith the lesson focuses to live by a faith that not only believes but also results in works that glorify God Lord, we come before this morning. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the sunshine you given to us, Lord. Let's go with us today. Sunday school will be here. Good discussion. Good questions. Good thoughts. Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the day. 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 We thank you Thank you. <coughs> okay, let's read the verses. Start with third. What does what does it profit my brethren, though a man say he has faith and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or a sister be naked and destitute of the other two. And one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled. <coughs> Notwithstanding, give them not those things which are needful to the body. What does the prophet? Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yet a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without faith, <coughs> and I will show thee faith by my works. There is one God, thou doest well, the devils also believe in trouble. But wilt thou, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Is not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son from the Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith. Likewise also was not Abraham the father justified by works. She had received the messengers and has sent them out another way. For as, the, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so the faith without works is also dead also. Okay, thank you. Looking at the first section here, faith and works. First verse there. The end of the verse says, it ends in a question form. Can faith save him? 
Jim start out by um, kind of makes this whole situation, you know, though a man say he hath faith and, hath, had, and have not works, can faith save him? <coughs> what is the answer to that question? Can faith save this man? Not that faith. I'm sorry? Not that faith. Not that man? Not that faith. Not that faith. That's right. He might have faith, but it's not the right kind of faith. Um, what uh, what kind of faith what kind of faith does this man have that even he says he has faith he thinks he does but he don't have anything to show for it what uh, what is this that he has that he calls faith <clears throat> it's kind of worthless because <clears throat> if I was in a building that was burning I believed it was burning but I wouldn't get out. So it wouldn't save me. Mm -hmm. um, verse 17 speaks about a dead faith. I think this man has a, a dead faith here in verse 14. Is there such a thing as dead faith? <laughs> I mean, it. I guess it seems like there is, but I'm not sure what uh, how you describe a, a dead faith. But, uh, well, it might even be something that used to be faith, okay. but it's not exercised. So one time we believe, but then we reason that works doesn't save me, so we won't practice works. Faith dies. Mm -hmm. Dead faith. Okay. It's not That's exercise. A, That's a good uh, explanation for that. What are your thoughts on the first section? Is there any thoughts on the verses 15 and 16 about the? The situation that we have there. Sort of, what are your thoughts on that? <clears throat> what do you think when people pray? They know people are in need of clothes or food and all their all that, and then they pray that God bless them that they well, would meet their faith, needs. And yet no we don't know how they have helping hand in situation. Um, you know, God meet the needs, but don't no use me to do it. Is that a dead faith or is it simply not being a good steward? Or, and I understand we can't help everybody. Yeah, I don't think it's possible for anybody, anyhow. But. How do you know you have faith if you don't have one? Well, what are your thoughts on that? Is it, are we, should we even be praying that God would help people if we're not willing to actually be that helper? When Jesus fed the multitude, <coughs> he used somebody's little bit and multiplied it. So we can't meet the big picture, but we can do something, and God can use that however he decides to use that to meet the need. Because that's where my, my mind was going to, was when we do have opportunity, um, I think it's important that we do uh, that we take action when we have the opportunity, but we can't meet every need that there is. We can pray for those needs, but we won't be able to meet every need. That's not really possible for any of us to do. I guess one thing that comes to my mind is um, just like the drug, drug he's up in. Say Akron, just for example, we can't meet every one of their needs. But if we're around here and we meet up with somebody in person, do we reach out to them or do we just say, well, we want to help them get out there? You know, we can pray for those, for the general, but do, if there's a person directly involved in our life, do we reach out to them or do we just kind of lump them in with all the other people and they need the Lord? 
neighbor's home? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I know what the easiest thing is to do. You know, you can. Uh, everybody around me needs help. There's really no way I can get to everybody, but it's important that we do. That our, our uh, it's important that our faith is, is uh, turned to action uh, when it, when there is opportunity for that. Building on those thoughts. Sometimes maybe we think that we can't, since we can't do all that's needed in a particular case, there's nothing we can do. But even in 2 Corinthians 9, Paul expressed a prayer, uh, a request. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. While you are enriched in everything for all liberality, which causes thanksgiving through us to God. So it, it's, in some cases it's like sowing a seed. You, you don't get the whole harvest right away. Maybe somebody else will help tend to that or even sow some more seed or something later on. But you can at least take some part in it and mm -hmm. do what you can. That's a good thought. I, I didn't hear everything Wendell said, but I think it was the poor people in Akbar, right? Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. know, if we have opportunity to participate in um, serving a meal up there once a month, we do. Um, <coughs> I, I was just thinking, you know, praying for the persecuted around the world and those that don't have Bibles. Well, I noticed uh, an offering was lifted for Bibles uh, during Bible school. You know, in a, just like Brother David said, you know, sowing the seed, we can't meet all the needs because there's millions of Bibles needed. But we can help a little bit yeah. as we have opportunity to help. Mm -hmm. um, one question that keeps coming to my mind is what about just, you know, that there's people reaching people and you just give money. And I'm not exactly sure how to put my question to words, but is it okay to just simply give? Does that make you feel as a part of it? Or should you be actively involved? I guess the thought is you can, well, well, I'll just give them 10 bucks, you know, and they can keep on doing their thing without actually being involved yourself. So, I don't know. I think I, I think I have to your question. thing is to do for a need. Um, you know, so someone comes up to us and, and asking for money or for something else. Is there, is there ways we can know how to best fill a need for a person? <clears throat> I think there's a couple different ways of looking at it. So I'm going to look at it from the standpoint of mission field. Um, I think you almost have two separate questions going on, but in regards to Richard, my mind would go to those who are actively on the mission field. Um, I know there are those who have come back already, and I've almost got the feeling that they feel like we aren't involved enough. Um, we aren't doing enough to help them over in their mission. They don't know what they're, we don't know what they're facing, and granted, we don't. But let's flip the shoe. If it wasn't for people 
being steady and maintaining consistency back home in their business and their work to help support the mission. Those people over in the mission field would not be able to do what they're doing. So it's pretty easy to point the finger and say, well, you're not doing enough to help the mission. But on the flip side, those who are over there are called by God to be there, and they aren't doing what we're doing back home to support them. Mm -hmm. So I believe that those who stay home are actually more involved than what we might think because we are putting our hands and feet to the plow here to help support the plow whatever country you pick, you know. Um, I well remember a man told me face to face of his brother who dedicated his life to staying in the U.S. but supported his mission. This man dedicated his life to the mission field. Um, so it can go both ways. Yeah. Now, if we just throw a $10 bill to the wind and say, God bless it, well, God can bless it. But I believe that our $10 bill can actually be much more than a $10 bill if you give it with the right heart. Now, I know it's a whole can of worms about the right heart. Okay? But if, if you give it knowing that that person is going to put it to the cloud, Better than what you and I can because they're over there. They see the actual need. I think we're actually very involved with missions, but sometimes we don't realize how involved we have to be. That's, thank you for that. That's very good. Yeah, I think that we're going to have to be mission field thing. Um, we're on a mission to be missionaries no matter where we're at. Um, and we have to remember that, that even though we're here in the U.S. and working and everything, we still have a duty we're called to do, and that should be a shining light around us, although it's very easily forgotten. And I think that's where this faith, we believe that we're going to make it to heaven even if we don't share the gospel to uh, somebody next door to us. Um, we think we're still going to make it there, but then um, if we're not doing that, we're not doing the work that it's talked about here, then we're going to lose that faith and it'll become dead. I think that's right. Yeah. <coughs> I look at this lesson this morning, and as I look at it, the fact that God and death just doesn't seem to go together. God and life does, but not death. And as we become believers in the Lord, there needs to be action in our lives. Show that we have action within within our hearts, that people see in heaven that we have joy, that we express something that is worth sharing with someone else. And that's why it's so important that none of us are ashamed of the gospel of Christ. If you're ashamed of it, I guess I would question really how much you have. Of it. You might claim to have like faith. Some people claim to have faith, but where's the evidence of it? Because mm -hmm. something really saved you from being eternally lost isn't what we're sharing. For instance, example, Maynard shared about the fire. If you were actually spared from being burned in, in a structure fire or whatever, wouldn't you share that with other people? Or you keep it to yourself? An eternal fire is going to be much worse. That's why. I, I appreciate the title that says Faith That Works. And then the subtitle says Faith and Works. And I know James, the writer, used faith and work. I, I know he did. Um, faith works is usually what I like to say. And oftentimes we get hung up in our interpretation of what that works is. This work that James is talking about is fruit. A fruit of the faith. Mm -hmm. Because I firmly believe we can have good works and it's not by faith. It's just on our own. But, you know, let's say we have an opportunity and there is a dilemma, like battling. I don't reach around, but there's an opportunity. What do I do? Well, 
the fruit of our faith is going to guide us into what God wants us to do. I was just thinking of um, Jesus' example in um, Matthew 25. You know, those people had no idea they saw Jesus destitute and hungry and thirsty and in prison. There was just the fruit of their faith in God. And they were ministering to Jesus. And I think that's what we're going to be doing. I don't think we're going to be emphasizing works. It's the fruit of our faith. And that would be my desire that my my faith is practical and, and the fruit is evident. And let's we'll forget about the works. Because the works can be lost in good works from man. Mm-hmm. For my own for my own from my own ambition and for my own glory. <laughs> if the faith is there, the works there's no there's no there's no option for the faith. But the, 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 the fruit the fruit will be there. Yes. Mm-hmm. I guess my mind was going down sort of that same same thought pattern there as per um, verse 19. Thou believest that there's one God, thou believest that there's one God, thou also believe in Trump. Um, and then if we look at the example it gives in the next section, we didn't get there yet, but we see evidence of works in their own lives. Like they took action in their faith. Of course, Satan. For Rahab, of course, saving her family, but um, I think sometimes more is caught and taught, and you know, we, we look at works as helping someone at all, you know, someone in need, whatever, or even saving a soul, or leading someone to Christ, I should say, that was it. Oh, but yet, how often times do we realize or think about what we're actually doing on a daily basis? How do people really see that? Are we just sort of casually living our lives? Or are we living it with the hope of the future? Or, um, yeah, I don't know exactly how to put it in words. But are we living it as we believe that eternity is just around the corner? That's a good challenge. Because I think, just as we see the devil as believe also, there's a lot of people that believe, but they don't live like they believe. Mm-hmm. Just like the person in fire, they believe that it's burning, but they don't believe it's burning. Mm-hmm. Isaiah speaks of all our righteousness as being like filthy rags. Um, self effort, our own, uh, our, own attempt, our own attempts to obey apart from having spiritual life. And in Romans 2, it talks about the Gentiles who do not have the law by nature doing the things in the law. They show the word of the law written in their hearts as a conscience bearing witness. So they know the standard. They, they know there's some things that are right and some things that are wrong. And you may even observe them, at least from time to time, doing what's right and rejecting what's wrong. But it's clear from the context that that's not what saves them. It's from the rest of Romans especially, it's being justified by faith, not by the works of the law. So it, you you can see sometimes what looks like fruit, what might might be fruit if it came from a heart that was exercising faith. But if it's from a heart that has this dead faith, this faith that isn't spiritually alive, then. It's not the true fruit. It's not real. It's it's kind of a, maybe kind of like the difference between fake flowers and real ones. It looks good in many cases, but it's not the real thing. That's a that's an interesting thought. I uh, I hadn't looked at it quite that angle, but I like this. I like that thought. Um, Somebody that just needs a listening ear.
what, uh, what, what drives a person to perform works without faith? What is, what's the, what's the, the push behind a, uh, behind good works that obviously are not backed by faith? Are you just listening because they want to listen here? Self-image. Okay. I was told that you work with the rest of Friday night. Could it be out of duty? Out of duty or out of fear or a kind of a, a sort of fear of God? Depends on your own peer pressure. Okay. To go with an attitude of love. A piece of conscience. Mm -hmm. And not because this is all things that got said not to be upset. Or it made a reason to switch your fight on my way. Go back. <laughs> <clears throat> You're more of a witness to others. Um, I'm kind of running behind here just a little bit, but the one quote that I had come across in a commentary simply summed it up that faith alone saves, but the faith that saves is not alone. It has good works with it. I think that that, uh, that pretty much that pretty much says what needs to be said. Um, Faith alone saves, but the faith that saves is not alone. Okay, let's move on into the second section. Is there, was there any more thoughts someone wanted to share on the first section? Examples of, of faith and works. Um, verse 21, speaking about Abraham, says he was justified by works. What did Abraham do that demonstrated his faith? Was there, was there more? Uh, instances in Abraham's life more than just uh, the, the situation where he was called to offer his son. Is there more more examples from Abraham's life that demonstrated faith in God? What about when he went down to Egypt? Remember, God told him not to go down to Egypt, and he went there. We don't want to dwell on the negative of individuals. Abraham had plenty of them. He lied, he did different things. Mm -hmm. But yet, Abraham, at this point in time, he put his faith in God. <clears throat> faith in God. <clears throat> How many of you would have, if you only have one son or one daughter, would have taken that, that individual to offer him, knowing your life is going to be taken? Abraham's faith feels like, I think at one point in time, he's going to come back. Well, how's Isaac going to come back if he's put on the, on the sacrifice? You know I mean? He's going to be burnt. Like, how, how is Abraham going to bring his son back? His faith is more than I can comprehend. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we look at these men as great men, and they were very great. But they also had shortcomings, you could say. The Bible does say all has sin comes short of the glory of God. Everybody. But yet... David did things in his life that was not really a building in that, but yet he was a man after God's own heart. It's what will you do with your, what you do with your life now, not what you've maybe done in the past. What are you doing this morning? How do you look at God? Are you living for God or not? Mm -hmm. Abraham, by faith, left his home country and sojourned didn't know where he was going. That's a good example of, of a true faith. You know, the Bible wouldn't point out the humanity of the people it speaks about. We couldn't relate with them. Mm -hmm. No, Abraham wasn't perfect. The Bible doesn't portray him as perfect. But he was still um, a friend of God. We can relate. We're not perfect. But we can still be friends of God. You know, when we look at Abraham's life, <clears throat> excuse me, and we see, like was mentioned, <clears throat> things that he did well, 
nearest things that have made, made mistakes. And I guess just, you know, thinking of today being Father's Day, we reflect on our dads, and sometimes we hold them up pretty high. I hope our children don't look at us and say that everything that we did was right on, mm -hmm. because it wasn't. We're just as human as what Abraham was. We made just as many mistakes. And I hope that even the next generation can see that, that not all of the steps that we took are worth following and have to be able to decide the difference. <clears throat> Same as with Abraham. Did Abraham know he was doing what was right? In other words, in our lives, do we really know what we should do? You know, we have an example now that you know, said that Abraham was justified by his work. Did he realize at that point in time what he was doing is really what God wanted him to do? Is it clear in our minds what we should be doing? That's really what I'm getting at. In our day today, we have the Bible and the Holy Spirit as a guide. What was Abraham's guide? How did he know what was right? Did he hear an audible voice from God that gave him black and white instructions? Or? In case of offering his son, he did. Okay. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> I would guess going down to Egypt, he acted on human reasoning. Yeah. I mean, there's a famine in the land, and why wouldn't you go where there's food? Mm -hmm. Most of us do some of that today, too. We depend on our common sense. All right. <clears throat> so we call it at least. Mm -hmm. Question, but the reason Abraham he did know what he was doing because he was close enough to know God, or he knew God, he knew the voice of God. Am I close enough to the scriptures that I know when right is right and wrong is wrong? A bit, a bit about uh, Rahab, and uh, I think we kind of covered the basic principles surrounding that. And, um, looking over here in the questions, the last question, number five, what are some ways we can effectively demonstrate our faith to the world around us? Um, it's kind of a, more of a a um, practical putting 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 this into practical living, and we did we did talk about this some too already uh, with giving and you know on the mission field doing stuff like that. Uh, is there any more thoughts on on uh, question number five? There ways that we can effectively demonstrate our faith to the world around us. And so could it be that these Jewish Christians have learned the there was a robbery in their neighborhood, and the other neighbor called and informed us about it. And talked about security lights and cameras and, and all of that. And I said, "Well, we don't. We're not concerned about that. What we have is is not our own. I mean, I don't want to be." Careless or anything, but I'm not scared. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's one way. Yeah. Yeah. Showing our faith. That's that's right. The world, or 
around this, a lot of people place their faith in other people. And I'm just thinking about the way the um, political world is in the U.S. right now. Where we can show them where our faith is. There's a lot of people who are upset and all that about it. And we can be a light and show them that we're on this world and our faith is on God. So does the absence of security lights demonstrate faith? <laughs> Probably not if you get dogs instead. Those other pen dollars. Might depend if you get a German Shepherd or a Chihuahua. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, my security light wasn't working. I do have one. And the neighbor was very concerned. Why isn't your security light working? You need to call the car company to, to get it replaced. And I said, well, it's not the car company, it's my own, it's on the other side of the meter. I will get it replaced soon. So I did, eventually. I don't know, is that a, is that a sign of faith or not? <laughs> there may be other purposes for a security type light. As well, it could be simply convenience or so that you don't trip over something when you're trying to walk towards your house or something like that, too. It's definitely nice for the visitors that come. The Bible does say about walking by faith and not by sight. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I guess I would like to uh, reflect that as a motion detector rather than a security light. Depends what kind of light you have, of course, that after some of them will come on to this activity. I just thought here about Rahab. What did she actually do that just <laughs> says that she had faith? Was she a believer at this point in time, or what did she actually do? I would like to look at what actually happened after the walls fell down. What did she do to uh, make sure her family was saved? You know, the spies had told her what she needed to do. And I think because of her face, she did something. What did she do? They were supposed to put a rope, uh, rope down there and all that. It's not that the children of Israel knew Rahab and her family and all that. It was a, a sign of who this family was, who God was to spare because of her actions prior to what I had, this account of this devastation that took place. So I think that's how she put her faith into action. You prepare your house. In other words, your family get them all around here so they can be safe. What are we doing as Bosnia in the home today? Are we taking the steps that need to be taken so our family know the way of the Lord? We can't save them, but we can take uh, steps in order that they will see the light. You can demonstrate what a saved life looks like. That's a good thought. I was thinking a lot about Rahab too. Um, in a lot of ways, her faith was greater than mine because she probably realized that her lifestyle and being a part of it obviously didn't align with what, what these men were. Mm -hmm. And I guess it's something that we hear struggle with people that come from broken homes, living deep in sin when they come to Christ, it, they deal with that past, you know, it's a struggle in their lives. And, you know, what I'm really curious is what type of life did they have? Did her life demonstrate a, a lifestyle faith after this? Does it speak any more about her in the Old Testament anywhere? I don't know. I was trying to think. I don't, I don't recall it events, but I don't know the Old Testament that well. But that's she a good buried thought. an Israelite. What's that? She buried an Israelite. Okay. It was included in the line of Christ. Okay. It doesn't explicitly state the answer, but it does stand to the line. She did continue believing in God. <laughs> it does, yeah. Okay, thanks for your thoughts.
brings our Sunday school hour to a close. We thank each one that put their faith to work by taking part in Sunday school. So we will have three songs and then we'll turn the time over to the ministry. Number 524 in the Christian hymnary. You look at this song, it says, Savior, teach me tape day by day. Sometimes in life, I'd like to know what's going to happen a little bit more in the future than day by day, but really I can't handle more than one day at a time anyhow. If you really had everything before you, what you're going to live, have in your lifespan, I don't think your heart's going to handle it. Think so? All the difficulties you might face and all that, but I don't know what the songwriter thought about when she wrote this song. But notice the words that it says, day by day. Let's sing, let's stand as we sing this song. 524. Savior, teach me day by day, love, sweet lesson to obey, sweeter lesson cannot be.
296. Two hundred and ninety-six. My soul be on thy guard. Number 842. Number 842. My faith is found a resting place.
say good morning, greet each one in Jesus' name this morning. My question to you this morning is, do you need to tell people about your faith? Or is it obvious by your lifestyle? I think both have their place. I mean, I think it's okay to talk about your faith, but I think it needs to be obvious by our lifestyle what we believe. And I believe that's where our testimony comes in. Welcome each one to the service this morning. I'm not sure, don't always try to uh, pat ourselves on the back, but uh, wish all of you fathers a happy Father's Day this morning. And I guess you all know who that applies to. The bulletin says, He that begetteth a wise child shall have joy of him. You know, and this morning we have much to be thankful for. As we think of our godly heritage, I'm not trying to get on to Burke's subject this morning, but I have recently read of many people that have no idea who their fathers are, and I'm thankful that's not in our settings here this morning. But even through all the testing and everything that's available out there, they're still in search of their fathers. But one thing that we all have in common this morning is that we can have a relationship with our Heavenly Father, regardless of our earthly father. I think Brother Michael said that sickness still affects us, and it does very closely. Some of us are affected with it personally sometimes. And thankfully, you know, there's a number on the sick list, and I'm not I don't want to miss anybody, but this isn't all inclusive this morning. As some of you are aware, Brother Ray Hirschberger has returned back to his home. And you know, some of us weren't sure where all that, none of us knows our future, but some of us were wondering where that was going to come out at, and God was definitely good to him. He has again returned to his home. They are enjoying their home life together as a two-person family, and we thank God for that this morning. Also, <clears throat> Sister Luala, as most of you know, was moved to a nursing home, and she is expected to again receive a injection this week to help to alleviate her pain. I'm not sure of all the details on that, but uh, continue to pray for Brother Herb and Sister Luala. And also, Brother Virgil, as some of you understand, he was taken to the hospital, um, was it yesterday? Saturday morning. And as I understand, most of his attachments are expected to be removed again today, so he is getting along just fine, best of my understanding. And also, Brother Galen is recuperating. So maybe there's others that we should add to that list, I'm not sure, but God is good, and I believe that, as far as I know, most everyone that's on that list is recuperating, unless some of you have someone they'd like to add to the list. I'm sure all of us are aware of this week's schedule, it's in the bulletin. There will be no Wednesday evening service, and then our meetings start on Thursday evening, Thursday evening and Friday evening, and then again on Sunday. There was some questions that came in regarding our current membership list and who all was added to that in the past two years, so you will find an updated list in your mailbox answering that question. If you have any further questions, feel free to ask any one of us. But again, this week, I believe, is one filled with probably much emotions, and I would trust that the greatest need of all is prayerfulness. I guess for us as a ministry team, we're looking forward to this week with anticipation, expectation, because the work of the church needs to go on until Jesus returns, and I trust that would be our goal and our emphasis, and we appreciate your unity and working together uh, towards that goal. Also, it's good to see Richard here with us this morning. You'll probably, most of you heard in the news is in the bulletin. Wish them the Lord's blessings on their addition to their family. Her name is Olivia Horney. 
and wish them the Lord's blessings. Are there any other announcements? We do have some birthdays this week. There is a Cheryl Steiner that has a birthday this week, and sometimes they identify them by their husband, and I guess her husband's standing up here this morning, so you know which Cheryl that is, and if you would just take notice, it is a special landmark for her, so maybe I'll have to remind her of that this week. Also, Brother Delbert has a birthday on Thursday. Happy birthday. And Wilma Horning has a birthday this week. Wish them all the Lord's blessings. Okay, if there's no other announcements, we'll ask the ushers to come forward. The offering this morning is for home missions. Shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, we come to you again this morning. Lord, we thank you for your love, your blessings that you have again showered upon us. Lord, we thank you for the beauty of the day. We thank you for giving us this opportunity to be here again this morning. And Lord, we also think of those that are sick, those that can't be here. We think especially of Ray Hirschberger, for her, Herb, and Noella, and Virgil, and Galen, and various ones, the many that are uh, missing this morning. We pray your blessing upon them in a special way. We thank you for what you have done for them. We thank you that our life is in your hand, that you are in control. You're the one that gives us every breath that we enjoy. We just pray your blessing on each one this morning. Pray also a special, special blessing on our fathers this morning as they fill their place in the homes, those that fill our place faithfully. Pray that you would meet our need. Pray that you give wisdom and direction to each one that we might be faithful servants where you have called us to. Pray also especially for Brother Bert as he ministers to us again this morning. Pray that you bless him with wisdom, direction as he shares. Pray that you give him clarity. Help him to share what you have laid upon his heart. And Lord, may each one of us be blessed by being here this morning. We pray for the offering as it is lifted. Pray that you would bless those that give. And as we share in the needs around us, we pray that our lives would honor you and the lives that we're able to touch would be blessed because of you this morning. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. I was in sin prison, so dark and cold. Just a lost sheep wandering from God's eternal fold. Then the door swung open, Jesus said to me, Greetings in Jesus' name. Walk a little slower, Daddy, said a child so small. I'm following in your footsteps, and I don't want to fall. Sometimes your steps are very fast. Sometimes they're hard to see. So walk a little slower, Daddy, for you are leading me. Someday when I'm all grown up, you are what I want to be. Then I will have a little child who will want to follow me. And I would want to lead just right and know that I was true. So walk a little slower, Daddy, for I must follow you. Author Unknown We love to wear your shoes, Daddy, as you can clearly see, pretending we're as big as you, for soon that day will be. We hope to be like you someday, strong, patient, full of love. You're the greatest dad on earth with quite the shoes to fill. Happy Father's Day. Blessed Father's Day to, to everyone. I recognize 
that not everyone here is a father. Not everyone hath a, hath a fa father living. Maybe we have a father that has not been a faithful father. Maybe the faults of our father are large in front of us. Earthly fathers fail. Earthly fathers are human. Our Heavenly Father can be the healer of all the hurts and all the pain that we have experienced because of the failure of an earthly father. As I was meditating, I recognized that a message cannot cover every aspect. But this message this morning is more geared towards fathers and potential fathers. But I trust it's the word of God and we all can receive from it. Matthew 5 48 says, Be ye perfect, even as your Father which in heaven is perfect. Is anyone here perfect? Is any father here perfect? Does anyone have a perfect father except the Heavenly Father? Perfect literally means complete, completeness a full age, manhood, growth into mental and moral character. Psalm 33, 12, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he has chosen for his own inheritance. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Blessed is the man whose God is the Lord and the family whom he has chosen for his inheritance. What makes a good person? What makes a good father? One whose God is the Lord. That, one, that is what makes a good father. One who has Jesus as Savior and Lord. One who is filled with the Holy Spirit. One who is becoming a full age. Becoming complete in the knowledge and in the in the grace of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, becoming perfect, even as our Father in heaven is perfect. Blessed is the man whose God is the Lord. Fathers, bless your children. Speak life into them. Have you heard that phrase before? Maybe that's a new buzz phrase amongst us. Bless your children, speak life. How can we bless our children? Proverbs 20, verse 7 says, The just man walketh in his integrity. His children are blessed after him. The just man walketh in his integrity, and the children are blessed. Being a man of integrity can be a blessing to our children. The quality of being honest and of strong moral principles. The state of being whole and undivided. Integrity. There are many struggles are, that our children face in life. And I'm going to say, fathers, let's not add to that struggle. By being inconsistent and hypocritical, we can add to that struggle. What does inconsistency and hypo in the hypocrite look like? I was just thinking, maybe you're not as human as I am. But one way of doing it is being one person at home and being a different person in public. Our children can see the transformation. I'm not talking about being formal in and informal because I have a formality that I use 
in public and I try to use it at home, but sometimes every day Bert comes out <laughs> at home. I'm talking about being patient and considerate, polite, take interest in other people. You're easy to please when we're in public. At home, we're selfish and difficult to please. We're sullen, impatient. Even if it's not an obvious, our children pick it up. They pick up on it that we are different at home than when we are not at home. Or if we're at home alone and we have company. We're in a conversation at home. It's a little tense, maybe a little edgy. I don't know if that's a word or not. The phone rings and you answer the phone with a total different voice. That is being inconsistent and hypocritical. Be a man of integrity, whole and undivided, strong moral principles, moral uprightness. In my meditations, I was thinking, I want this message to be positive. So following is a positive warning for us. In other words, it's a little negative. In the pursuit of providing for our family, could it be that we sacrifice our family rather than providing for them? Leviticus 8.21 says, And thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Molech, neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God. I am the Lord. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 12. Let not thy seed pass through the fire to Molech. That is found in Leviticus, but in Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 20. God is giving these commands to the children of Israel. Deuteronomy 12, verse 20. When the Lord thy God shall enlarge thy border, as he has promised thee, and thou shalt say, I will eat flesh, because thy soul longest to eat flesh, thou mayest eat flesh, whatsoever thy soul lust is after. If the place where the Lord thy God has chosen to put his name there be too far from thee, then thou shalt kill of thy herd and of thy flock, which the Lord has given thee, as I have commanded thee, and thou shalt eat in thy gates whatsoever thy soul lust is after. Even as the roebuck and the heart is eaten, so thou shalt eat them. The unclean and the clean shall eat of them alike. Only be sure that thou eat not the blood, for the blood is the life, and thou mayest not eat the life with the flesh. Thou shalt not eat it. Thou shalt pour it upon the earth as water. Thou shalt not eat it, that it may go well with thee, and with thy children after thee, when thou shalt do that which is right in the sight of the Lord. Only thy holy things which thou hast, and thy vows thou shalt take, and go unto the place which the Lord has chosen. And thou shalt offer thy burnt offerings, the flesh, and the blood upon the altar of the Lord thy God, and the blood of thy sacrifices shall be poured out upon the altar of the Lord thy God, and thou shalt eat the flesh. Verse 28, Observe and hear all these words which I command thee, that it may go well with thee, and with thy children after thee forever, when thou doest that which is good and right in the sight of the Lord thy God. When the Lord thy God shall cut off the nations from before thee, whether thou goest to possess them, and thou succeedest them, and dwellest in their land, take heed to thyself that thou be not snared by following them after by following them, after that they be destroyed from before thee, and that thou inquire not after their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods? Even so will I do likewise. Thou shalt not do so unto the Lord thy God, for every abomination to the Lord which he hateth have they done before uh, have they done unto their gods, for even their sons and their daughters they have burned in the fire to their gods. 
What things soever I command you, observe to do, thou shalt not add thereto, nor diminish from it. You may eat the flesh. You may eat, it will go well with thee. It will go well with thy children. Offer burned offerings. Observe and hear all the words that I command you, that it may go well with thee, and with thy children forever. When thou doest that which is good and right in the sight of God. But don't do like the heathen do. Don't do like the heathen did. They have done every abomination, even sacrificing their sons and daughters. They offered to Molech. The offering to Molech was for financial gain. It was for future children. The God of Molech was a fertility God. Prosperity, pleasure, they sacrificed a child so that it would rain, so that the crops would grow, so that there would be food to eat. There would be plenty of free time, plenty of time for, pres uh, for pleasure. The Bible mentions numerous kings of Judah and Israel that did the same. Ahaz, Hosea, Manasseh are three of them that are named. One writer I found likened it unto abortion. Children are a hindrance to my schedule. They are expensive. They limit my career. I want to bring it closer home. Neglecting our children in the name of providing for them. Being absent from our children because of our work in the name of providing. Neglecting our children because of our hobbies, pleasure trips. Neglecting our tri children because of prosperity. Because of personal time. The way I understand, Molech was an idol, the head of a bull. He was positioned with his hands out like this, and his arms created a chute down to the belly where the fire was burning. The picture I saw in one of the dictionaries, picture dictionary, a priest was up there offering the child, and there was a lot of priests around with their trumpets. I can imagine there was a lot of noise to drown out the crying of the baby. The baby would be offered, and as it got hotter, the baby would squirm and slide down the, uh, the arms into the fire. I was wondering if we surround ourselves with a lot of noise so we don't hear the crying of our children for attention. The crying of our children that we are sacrificing in the name of prosperity, in the name of pleasure, in the name of providing. They did this so that they would prosper. God says to the children of Israel through Jeremiah verse 32 I'm sorry chapter 32 verse 36 Now therefore thus saith the Lord the God of Israel concerning this city whereof ye say it shall be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon by by the sword and by the famine and by the pestilence they desired peace they desired prosperity and Jeremiah says you will receive opposite you will receive sword you will receive you will receive fighting. You will receive famine and pestilence. They desired peace, prosperity, and, and pleasure. They received opposite. 
Ezekiel 23:36 The Lord said moreover unto me Son of man wilt thou judge Ahola and Aholaba yea declare unto them their abominations that they have committed adultery and blood is in their hands with their idols have they committed adultery and have also caused their sons whom they bear unto me to pass from them through the fire to devour them Moreover, this they have done unto me. They have defiled my sanctuary in the same day, and have profaned my Sabbath. For when they had slain their children to their idols, then they came to the same day into my sanctuary to profane it. And lo, thus have they done in the midst of mine house. Did you, did you hear that? They sacrificed their children, and then they came into the sanctuary. They were offering their sons to an idol, and then they wanted to worship God. And the same day, Jesus said, that's not possible. You can't serve God in mammon. Joshua invited the children in his day, Choose you this day whom you will serve, the gods which your father served, that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. Joshua said, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua recognized you can't serve both. It is written, we have heard it so often, but still we try. Still we try to serve both. Awake thou that sleepest, put away from you the God of materialism, put away the God of pleasure, put away the God of pride and selfishness. Psalm 115, 4 through 8, their idols are silver and gold. The work of men's ha hands Maybe our idols are not silver and gold, but they're wood and metal. They have mouth, they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet they have, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. These verses just describe to us an idol image. Listen to verse 8. They that make them are like unto them. So is everyone that trusts in them. Dead. We are just as dead as the idols that we have in our life. We are just as dead as our business is, if our business is our idol. Just as dead as our house, our trucks, our happy farms. Dead. No sound, no spirit, no life. Just dumb idols. Will we sacrifice our children for an idol? Children are a blessing from God. Children are a gift of great value. I encourage us that we would use the power of influence to bless our children. The power of influence, the first person that came to mind was Jehoiada. When Joash was king, it went well. Joash did that which was right in the sight of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada the priest. As long as Jehoiada was alive, Joash did what was right. After the death of Jehoiada, Joash turned away from God. Psalm 145 encourages us, verse 4, Psalm 145, verse 4 encourages us, One generation shall praise thy works to another and shall declare thy mighty acts. Isaiah 38, 19 the living, he shall praise thee as I do this day. The father to the children shall make known thy truth. Fathers, do our children know what God has done in our life? Are we one generation praising God to another generation? Declare the mighty acts of God. Make known the truth to our children. Or do we sacrifice our children?
I have never been overly protective of my vehicles. Maybe it's a pet peeve of mine when children are punished for brushing a truck. Now I understand, if you have your truck all shined up, I understand there needs to be respect taught. The children shouldn't just be running all over the truck and, and touching. Or I thought about the house. Our, our children yelled at when they bring dirt into the house. A house should be lived in. Our children, they can be taught to not mess up a clean window, but it's not lights out if they do touch a window, right? They can be taught to not ruin a clean window, especially when company is coming tomorrow. But then still, let's not sacrifice our children for our house or our vehicle. We can be a blessing for our children and our grandchildren, or we can be a hindrance. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. God said, I will visit the iniquity third and fourth generation. But the next verse is the blessing, showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me. And I don't know, you can read that as thousands of people or thousands of generation. Showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. We can be a blessing to thousands of generations. The iniquity is only passed down three or four generations. But the love of God and obedience affects thousands. Job 5.2 For wrath killeth the foolish man, and envy slayeth the silly one. I have seen the foolish taking root, but suddenly I curse his habitation. His children are far from safety, and they are crushed in the gate, neither is there any to deliver them. Whose harvest the hunger eateth up, and taketh it even out of the thorns, and the robber swalloweth up their substance. Talking about a foolish man and what happens to his family. His children are far from safety. They are crushed in the gate. They go hungry. Fathers, don't be a foolish man. Psalm 106 talks about Phineas. What a blessing he was to his generation. Then stood up Phineas and executed judgment and so the plague was stayed. And that was counted unto him for righteousness unto all generations forevermore. It says that because of Phineas' faithfulness and standing up and executing judgment, it says all generations forevermore were blessed after him. Which will we be blessing or cursing to the following generation? Turn with me to Psalm 112. How can we bless our children? How can we be a blessing for our children? Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord, that delighteth greatly in his commandments. His seed shall be mighty upon the earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. Wealth and riches shall be in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Unto the upright there arises light in the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. A good man showeth favor and lendeth. He will guide his affairs with discretion. Surely he shall not be moved forever. 
the righteous shall be in everlasting remembrance. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. He shall not be afraid until he see his desire upon his enemies. He has dispersed. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endureth forever. His horn shall be exalted with honor. The wicked shall see it and be grieved. He shall gnash with his teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked shall perish. How can we bless our children? Fear the Lord. Blessed is the man that fears the Lord. And his children will be blessed afterwards. Fear God. Your seed, your children shall be mighty. Generations to come, our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, our great-great-grandchildren, to thousands of generations, righteousness shall endure. They will be a light in the darkness, full of compassion. They will be generous and discreet. They will be secure in the faith. They will be remembered forever, not afraid but steadfast, trusting in God, established in heart. Care for the poor. Exalt it with honor. The wicked see all this blessed generation. They desire to destroy it, but this generation cannot be destroyed. Psalm 128 would be very similar the man, uh, behold that thus, sorry, behold that thus shall the man be blessed that fears the Lord. The Lord will bless thee out of Zion, and thou shalt see the good of Jerusalem all the days of thy life. Yea, thou shalt see thy children's children in peace in Israel. How does the fear of God look today? After Abraham offered Isaac, the angel of the Lord told him, Now I see that thou fearest God. Abraham showed his fear of God by unquestioning obedience. Does it still look like that today? Unquestioning obedience? Children desire to be loved and cherished. They desire to be loved and cherished by their father. It brings security in their life. Absalom cried out because of the void in his life. He cried for love and acceptance. Esau sought for blessing from Jacob. Sad is the child that has been rejected by his father. There is a void. There is a hurt. There is a lack of security. But I want to say that there is a God that wants to be our father that can heal that void. Fathers and potential fathers I don't know where we are at. We have quite a variety of people here. And if we have a father, if we have a grandfather that was faithful, I would encourage us, let's build on that. Let's take it one step further and build on our goodly heritage that we have. If there was a grandfather... That was not faithful. If there is a father that has rejected me, that has caused the void in my heart, God wants to heal that. I was thinking about that chain of generations, third and fourth generation, 
We don't need to stay there. Who's going to break that chain? God is well able to fill that void, to heal that hurt. I know it might be more difficult. But God is well able to break that chain and to overcome and to start the blessing for thousands of generations rather than continue on to the third and fourth, genera fourth generation. The Jewish fathers often put their hands on their children and they pronounce blessing upon their children. When they came home from synagogue, at the Shabbat meal, the mother and the father both put their hands on their children and pronounced blessings upon them. Fathers, bless your children verbally. When they go to class, bless them. I usually do not encourage whispering in church. But if the superintendent is here and dismisses your child, I give you permission to bless them as they leave the pew and go to class. Pray for them audibly in their presence. Know their hurts, know their troubles, know their plans. Pray for them. Thank God for them audibly in their presence. Fathers, we are a hero to our children when they are small. When they are young, we are their hero. Don't worry, they'll change their minds later. I found this quote, small boys become big men through the influence of big men who care about small boys. Small boys become big men through the influence of big men who care about small boys. But I'm going to say not only boys, also for girls. Girls will become ladies. Fathers, you are the first man that your girl loves. Hugs are appropriate. Appropriate. Bear hugs are appropriate when the girls are small. When they're grown, it is appropriate to put your arm around their shoulder. That's a tall order, fathers. The girl, you are the first man that the girl loves. Don't betray them. Don't turn away from God. Don't pursue after the filth of this world and betray that trust to your boys and to your girls. I remember being at a ball game. Sitting beside his son, his father had just hit the ball and I think it, he was running the bases. And he looks at me and says, that's my dad. I cannot think of any need in childhood as strong as the need for a father's protection. Your presence represents strength. No one is as strong as you are in their eyes. In your strength, be tender. Here's another quote. quote Nothing is as strong as tenderness. Nothing is as tender as true strength. A father means so many things. An understanding heart a source of strength and support right from the very start. A constant readiness to help in a kind and thoughtful way, with encouragement and forgiveness no matter what comes your way. A special generosity and always affection too. A father means so many things when he's a man like you. Can we live up to that? Can we be strong and tender? Can we be tender with true strength? Fathers, again, our children are little people. Let's not let them down.
Let's not betray that trust. Let's not betray the gift that God has given us, the fathers that we need to be or that we want to be. I trust that is our, our desire. To be a man of integrity, to fear God, and to bless our children verbally. I pray that is our desire. Be ye perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. May you find your heavenly Father, where, wherever we are in life, may we find our heavenly Father will fill that void, if there is a void. May we find our Heavenly Father give us wisdom and grace and strength to be faithful in where He has called us. Shall we have a song?
Did you see the verse that was printed in the bulletin? I'm sorry, not a verse, just that little quote on the f inside the first page. The world needs fewer man-made gods and more God-made men. I say amen. We have a fellowship meal afterwards. I don't know, had you mentioned that? <laughs> All right. So I expect we will... Um, thank the Lord for the food and the, and the dismissal prayer. Welcome everyone to stay. Find your way downstairs to, for fellowship and food afterward. Thank you for being here. I invite you to stand for a dismissal prayer. Father in heaven, we again are grateful for your love to us. Thank you for the morning, the new morning. Thank you for your blessings. Lord, we are unworthy, but we acknowledge that you are God, you are our Father. Thank you for godly fathers in our life. Thank you for the blessing that they are, have been to us, they, they are to us, and I ask that you would meet our needs, that we can also be faithful, godly, and men of integrity. We can live our lives in a way that is pleasing to you and is a blessing to our families. Lord, I thank you also that you are a father that will meet the need of a void that is left by an unfaithful father. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here that feels that void, that you would touch their life, meet that need. Lord, I pray that the Jane would be broken and that the blessing of to the generations falling can be real. Dismiss us with your blessing. Thank you for our food to eat. Pray that you would bless our fellowship as we meet together in the basement. For your honor, for your glory, in Jesus' name, amen. There's a city of light in the stars we are told.